Welcome to Consulting Mastery, where we help B2B consultants master the business of consulting. I'm Carrie. And I'm Ahmed. Join us as we explore the art of delivering outstanding client value, earning a higher income, and thriving in today's marketplace. All right. So tell me something, because we spend a lot of time out there in the world, you know, us specifically supporting people to connect with prospects and close deals. And I have a super simple question for you. And that is this, what is it that clients are actually buying? Desires, ultimately, like they buy what they want. They buy a future state. They buy, they buy the things that they believe will get them to a desired future state to bring all those words together, right? We're all walking around as individuals and businesses and remember businesses are ultimately a collection of individuals. Like it's not, you know, yes, we specialize in B2B, but at a human nature level, it's all the same stuff. We're, we're seeking some kind of a future state. We have a desired future state that's different from our current state. And what we buy are we buy things that help us make progress towards our desired future state. Yeah. And th this is the conversation I want to have because far too often we get caught up on the thing that we think someone wants to buy or even that we want to buy, right? If I decide today that I need a car, I, that's what I'll say. I need a car. I need to buy a new car. What you and I both know is it's not so much that I need a new car. There are things I need from that purchase, right? From that future state. So I need to be able to get from point A to point B. I need to do it in a way that is comfortable. I need to do it in a way that is faster than everybody else. Whatever the desire is, that's the true thing that somebody's buying. And this is not just important in, um, you know, framing your offer. But this is something that's critical all the way through the journey from when you first connect with someone, from when you are putting, you know, thought leadership or, or really anything out into the world, through to having very specific conversations about their needs, through to closing the deal, and quite frankly, even beyond that. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's far more complicated in the consulting world because, you know, we tell clients this all the time, no one ever woke up in the morning and said, I need to hire a consultant. That's correct. You know, your car breaks down and I need a car, right? Or your lease expires and I need a car, but no one ever said I need a consultant. And, and that's both the challenge and the opportunity of selling consulting is it's intangible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the client often doesn't know or realize they need a consultant. What they know and realize is there's a problem to be solved and or that they are not uh, on the path to getting to their desired future state. And so your your challenge as a consultant is not only to articulate that you can help them get to that desired future state, which is really important. <clears throat> Otherwise, why would they care? Why would they pay attention? You, A lot of you, to use your example, Carrie, are going to the marketplace right now and saying, I have a car. Yes. <laughs> I have this car. It's a great car. It's got air conditioning. Like, I'm, like I said, that's a feature now, right? What, what are modern features? It's got massage seats right it's got you know quad zone itself. climate control right it's got yeah. self parking it's got all these things right and the client's like oh well, i don't need a car so i'm not going to pay attention to you their well, question yeah. is who can get me to my desired future state more yes. than what does your car look like yeah and it's worth recognizing that we'll stick to the car <laughs> the car story for a moment here it's also not the only solution. I think that's the other thing that consultants often, you know, where a mistake happens is going out into the world as if your solution is the only one, or if it's about choosing between consultant A and consultant B, when the reality is I can buy a car, I can rent a car, I can take the bus, I can call an Uber, you know, take a taxi. Same thing out there in the world of solving problems, right? I can decide to hire someone internally. I can decide just to live with the problem. I can decide to bang my head against the wall for the next six months. You know, there are many ways to approach the problem. And if you believe that your client is already at a place where they're looking for a consultant, if they haven't overtly told you that, then you're going to get yourself into, into trouble because you're far too far down the conversation path and, and certainly beyond where they are. 
Yeah, and like let's let's be honest about this, right? So the the challenge here is you as a consultant, as an expert, you know, you you're somewhat enamored with your own expertise, right? Yeah. You're drinking your own Kool Aid, and we all do it. We're guilty of it too. And you know the 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 curse of expertise. What that hinders, and we're all we all suffer from that. We all have the curse of expertise, in that we don't know what it's like to not know what we don't what we know. Right? We 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 forget what the before. At some point, you didn't have this expertise, and maybe you were never even in the client's position to begin with. If you're like a true consultant, you've never actually been in the client's shoes, and that hinders empathy. Right? That creates an empathy gap. And maybe you were in the client's shoes, solved the problem, now became a consultant. There's still an empathy gap because you don't really remember what it was like to not know what you know. And so when you have this, this expertise, and this is kind of the, the, the crux of the challenge of commercializing expertise and selling consulting, is it's hard to meet the client where they're at. Because to you, certain things are obvious. Obviously, you need this. Obviously, in your situation, in your context, you need to do this. But it's not so obvious to them. And, and so to me, it kind of comes down to, I think a lot of people feel like having expertise is sufficient. I have this expertise. Why aren't people buying it? I have this expertise. It should be deployed. But there's a difference between having expertise and commercializing expertise. Commercializing expertise requires doing all the things that you just said, which is contextualizing who's it for. What do they want? How can my expertise get them there? And how can it get them there more efficiently and more effectively with a higher rate of success than all the other available options to them? And it's not just about resting on your laurels and going, well, I'm an expert at X, so you should hire me. That doesn't get you hired. And it's tricky business. I mean, you said it, and let's say it again. It's hard to meet the client where they are. And what you really need to do here, what we're, you know, what you're trying to do all the time when you're having these conversations is get to a place where the solution can be delivered to a client who needs it, right? Like that's the, at the, at its base, the simple way of describing what needs to happen. But because we're dealing with people, potentially two people, potentially more, if you're, you know, selling into an organization, there's the kind of factual version of this solution will solve this problem. But the, the real thing that you're dealing with is everything around that, right? Your perception of the problem, their perception of the problem, what does solving the problem or not solving the problem mean to them? You know, all of these things that are much less tangible and therefore much more challenging, but also much more necessary if you're truly going to get into partnerships that allow you to bring your expertise, you know, to the appropriate problem and really help people move along. Well, it's so interesting because I think, you know, we, we see a lot of limiting beliefs, if you will, in, in B2B consultants, when they first come to us, we, we kind of, you know, we, we, we have to deal with a lot of these limiting beliefs and have to kind of uproot them and replace them with more empowering beliefs. And and one of those limiting beliefs I find is this idea that, well, I really have to sell myself. Mm -hmm. I, I really got to sell my expertise. I really got to prove that I'm the best. And what that belief often entails consequentially is an, an overemphasis on selling your process, selling your car, like we talked about earlier, and articulating the benefits and the features and the experience of your amazing process because they have to believe it's the best. Whereas more often than not, what kills the deal to your point is this is not a priority for us right now. We don't know if you're going to be able to get us to where we want to go. We don't know if your car will get us to, it's a fine car, but it may not get us to our destination. I had this conversation this morning with our marketing manager. And the question that was posed to me was, we have this pipeline of clients who, you know, let's say roughly 50% of people that we make offers to, to join us, don't actually engage. And the question was, is there not opportunity here? And I said, there may be, but these people have said no to our vehicle. You know, they've said, 
this is not going to get me to where I want to go, or I'm not comfortable in this vehicle for whatever reason. I don't know, but I want to talk them out of that. That's a decision that they made. And so my point is where deals go to die is not because they don't like your car. It's because they don't believe it's going to get them to where they want to go, or they don't think it's the right fit for them. Or there's some other internal, you know, you know, challenge related to their decision making that makes that makes it a not a now thing or, or or not a great fit. But my point is, it doesn't mean they don't think you have a good car. <laughs> and so you could you could talk about your car all you want, but it's not necessarily going to give them belief that it's the right car for them. So we talked a lot about why this is challenging. What's the answer? How do we get there? Well, I think you have to take things back to their fundamentals, right? And and the fundamentals of selling anything to anyone are people buy what they want. They buy things that they want because they believe that those things will get them to where they want to go, right? They have goals. They have a desired future state. They have, they have things that they want to achieve in life and in business. And they buy the things that they want to engage with in order to get to that destination. And so I think what you have to do is kind of put your car aside for a moment and really understand where do my people want to go? What are they trying to achieve? What are their goals? And, and, and when you're dealing in a B2B context, which is certainly our audience here, don't think about this in a kind of s- sterile organizational context, right? Like, well, they want to increase revenue by 13% per year. No, but like, what do the people want? Mm -hmm. Organizations don't make decisions. People in organizations make decisions. So that CMO, that CRO, that CTO, that director of procurement, that whoever your person is, you got to be clear on who your person is. What do they want? What are they trying to achieve? And then secondarily, (laughs) can you create a vehicle that gets them to where they want to go? And if you can connect those two things, what they want, where they want to go with your vehicle, now you've got a powerful proposition. 